Hey, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. Today, we're talking details. When I asked you guys what you wanted most to see next on the channel, the majority of the responses were details. So I thought I'd break down an existing project that I've already done, it's already been constructed. We'll take the detail sheet for this fireplace and walk through all the decisions we made along the way to get to the finished product. So this project was a single family residence, custom residence, sitting out over the ocean. Some very interesting sort of design challenges here. So there was only a couple of requests from the client for the design directive. It had to be unique, something that they had never seen before. It had to utilize at least one element from the site and it had to be a fire pit. So we're not just talking fireplace, we're talking fire pit. Now the fire pit was a particular challenge because they actually didn't want any chimney for this project at all. So like everything else, we start with a concept and the client helped to inspire the concept for the fireplace design by giving us the directive of using a fire pit as a sort of motif and also a natural site element. That combined with the concept for the structure, which is based around these old fishing shacks and wharf buildings that dot the coast of Maine, you know, the structure itself appears to hover out over the water and we have a series of cantilevered decks. So this concept of hovering sort of made its way into the concept for the fireplace. I thought the natural site element could be one of these giant boulders that we had removed from the site during the excavation process and we had them stockpiled, we could use one of these giant boulders and kind of float it inside the living space which was itself floating out over the water. And then to de further develop this fire pit concept, because we couldn't have it be a completely open fire pit, we, needed, we knew we needed a way to capture the combustion gases. So I thought we could again float this chimney element above the floating boulder. So after a series of basic design sketches, we settled on this preliminary design. We draw details to not only explain how we want things to look, but also the sequence and the order in which all of these materials and assemblies are to go together. So it's about being very specific here. And the way I like to think about detailing is this balance between aesthetic concerns and technical concerns. So here, the aesthetic concerns are this idea about making a fire pit. We talked about hovering, this hovering boulder in the space and hovering a chimney over that. So there's some aesthetic ideas there. The technical concerns primarily are health and safety. It's a fireplace, it's a dangerous item potentially, and there are codes and restrictions that govern its design and installation. Now there's other technical concerns like how are we actually gonna build this, uh, but those are sort of subservient to the health and safety ones. Now we have to satisfy both of those concerns. We have to deal with aesthetics and we also have to deal with the technical concerns, safety, health, and well-being. But how you balance those is reflected in how you decide to detail. Okay, so we're looking at the finished detail sheet. And I think it's important to say that this is the result of many, many iterations and many hours worth of work. I don't just start with this. I don't sit down and draft this as a finished product. I take the information that I know in general terms and I start drafting that. Now, as you look at your design, ask yourself what questions are the tradespeople that are gonna be assembling this gonna have? Your details are meant to answer those questions. So we started with the boulder here, the plan in plan view, and then I have a sectional view above that. Oftentimes that will be an elevation view and the sections will all be paired together. You can see I have an elevation view on this side and some sectional information here. So if I were just to start this sheet from scratch, I'd probably bring in the sectional information. So I know I have a section here of this space. And I know I have my boulder in this space and I know I have conceptually this chimney element which is coming through the roof here. So I start with that. I know I have a plan view of the space, chimney above it. And then I know I'm gonna have some sectional information at each one of these waypoints. So those might be larger details here through the cowling, through the rough boulder shape with the cowling above it, and then maybe some larger plan, plan details and how things are gonna fit together and everything then gets noted up here. So conceptually, that's my sheet layout. Title block is over here like that. Keep things orderly and tidy and have them make sense on the detail sheet for the person that's trying to interpret the information that you're trying to convey. Okay, we essentially have two parts here. We have the hearth element and we have the chimney element. 
So I started by measuring the exact dimensions of the boulder that the client selected, and I drew that both in plan and in elevation so we could really get a sense for its size. I also wanted to plug it into the overall building section so I could get a sense for you know, how it sat in the space. With a fireplace, there's very specific code requirements that we had to satisfy, and when we start thinking about details, we need to be really cognizant of this. So you can see here this red circle, this red ellipse on the plan, denotes the hearth clearance that we need for this size fire tray. So there's a certain dimension here, and it's gonna vary depending on where you practice or where you live. So I'm not gonna give you the exact dimensions, but we knew the size we were working with here. Now, to maximize the amount of fire that was occurring in this, and also keep it to a reasonable size proportionally in the space, this helped suggest the size of the fire tray and the geometry of the fire tray. You'll notice that all of the boulders that we pulled out of this site, they all have a very similar geometry, and that's a function of how large a boulder an excavator can pick up and remove, and then also how large a boulder we can ship across land here to the storage facility. So these all end up being sort of these linear elements. Now, you can imagine if we wanted to make a really long linear fire tray, and I'm just exaggerating this dimension here, for example, the clearances that we need for that kind of a fire tray end up being way out here, which suggests you know, a boulder size and geometry that we just didn't have access to. Equally, as we start looking at this in section, and if I draw just a basic section of the living space here, and we have this floating boulder element here, and then we have a chimney, if we need to collect all those combustion gases for a long linear fire element like this, it means the chimney is gonna be this just massive dominating element in the space. So we didn't want that either. So we kind of used the technical concern here of the hearth clearance to help shape, and the actual boulder that we selected to help shape the fire tray design. Now, could we have made it round? Could we have made it rectangular? Sure, but each of those had a different set of trade-offs. Now, from here, we started working closely with the fireplace company out of Vancouver to design the fireplace and secure all the necessary permits before we went too far with the design. So, although this fire tray and this whole assembly looks very minimal, there's actually a lot we've concealed inside the boulder and beneath the fire tray here to make this all possible. Now, I wanna just take a moment and talk about these details up here. This is just representative of how far you can take the design. The client actually wanted to be able to control the height and the pattern of the fire, and actually even the color. And in the end, we didn't go with any of these designs, but you can see we have multiple options that we explored and worked through with the fireplace company and the client, and you can see these design iterations here. So inside this simple boulder here, we have to conceal the fire tray, the burner assembly here, the gas line, the interlock, combustion air, a whole number of things need to get concealed beneath this fire tray. Now, each of these things had clearances and access requirements too, so as the details evolved, we ended up drawing each one of these components in the drawing, and that same goes for the collection hood above it. This is the essence of architectural detailing, taking the actual thicknesses of materials, the orientations and fastening methods, the actual sizes of systems and components, and you start defining their relationship to the designed whole. So we took this information to our stone fabricator so they could incise the boulder to accommodate it all. So I want to return to the concept for a moment. We wanted the boulder to appear to be hovering in the space, right? So we started working with our engineer to design an inset concrete plinth, and you'll see that right here, and it's inset into the bottom of the boulder, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now lifting this up in the air also brings it closer to seated eye height. So if we have, you know, we're seated here in the living room, and you're gazing off in this direction, the flames are all brought close to your eye height, so that's nice. Now, it's also a way of abstracting the idea of a fire pit. And you can see if we recessed this in the floor, there's a very specific collection hood dimension here that we would need to bring down to the floor level. And in that case, our seated eye height, you know, this chimney element then becomes an obstruction in the space. It's not something we can see through. So lifting it helps us achieve our design concept. But we couldn't just rest the irregular surface of the underside of the boulder here on top of a flat concrete plinth. And so what we did was we carved out a recess on the underside of this boulder to accommodate that rectangular plinth that it's sitting on. Now we didn't use concrete anywhere else in the project, so to tie this base here to the rest of the project, we basically used stainless steel plate that gets anchored into the concrete pour here so that when we 
uh, are done casting the form, casting the concrete, we have a level pad to set this boulder on top of, but the finished edge of it is actually stainless steel, so it matches all the other materials. So one thing you learn quickly as you begin to build your work in the world is that construction is all about sequencing. So when you're designing, you always need to be thinking about sequencing because it's entirely possible to design something that's impossible to construct from a sequencing standpoint. So here, if we have our space that's all framed up, hovering out over the pond, we need a way to get this boulder into the space. So we knew we needed to crane it through the roof, down through the roof. So we knew from a sequencing standpoint that we couldn't sheathe the roof or have any structural members in the way that would prevent us from doing that. This was so heavy that we couldn't just bring it, you know, crane it onto the deck on the side and then move it horizontally into place. We had to bring it down and drop it onto this existing plinth here. Now, that also meant that once we got this in place, that anything that needed to be incised into it, whether that's from the bottom or from the top, that already needed to be done. And in order for that to be done, we actually needed a template of this actual fire tray that we were gonna drop into, the, into there, that elliptical fire tray that we were gonna put in with all the holes and everything already. And then we also needed to know how much combustion air we needed to feed to it and the other requirements and parts and pieces that made up that whole assembly. And in order to have those fabricated, we needed sign off from the code officials. So you can see there's a set of sequences that's happening that you need to really prepare for in order to get here. Um, this happened to be a fast track job, so everything was in construction while we were still designing this. So that complicated things a little more. But you can see we order the tray, we get the permanent, we get the permitting approval, order the tray, the tray gets templated, we get the stone fabricated, we drop that into place, and then the other sequences can start happening too. And the same is actually true for the chimney assembly, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, I wanted the fire tray. And this chimney element, so the fire tray that's inset into this boulder here, and the chimney element, I want them to be related. Now, the chimney element needed to collect all of these combustion gases here that are flowing up from the fire, so it needs to be actually slightly larger, but I did want to repeat the geometry above it. It just made sense. And actually, rounding these corners makes it feel like a smaller element in the space. So I blocked out these requirements in elevation. And again, I started working with the fireplace company, my engineer. And this time we also brought in a metal fabricator to help us choose the right gauge materials. For the design to meet code, we had to use all of these UL listed components. And you'll see I've called them out here in the detail. Now, these UL listed components, some of them were pretty ugly. So here, the aesthetic concerns outweighed the technical concerns. And we could have expressed the actual elements of the chimney, all of the stuff you see exposed here. But we chose to conceal them inside this elliptical cowling that we designed. And in there, we had to fit the collection hood, and that was tied to the chimney system and this exhaust mechanical fan system. And all of this had to be supported at the roof level here. So I start with the general drawing. You know, we have the general size and shape of things, and then I start filling in the details. Now, because I wanted this chimney to appear to be hovering in the space, you know, remember we're returning to this concept here where it's hovering above the fire element, the fire pit element. This whole chimney had to be designed to be cantilevered from this roof assembly, and that's where this set of details kind of comes into place. Now, sequencing applies to the design of the chimney too. To install the flue and test it, we had to create this kind of skeletal structure here, then hang it from the roof assembly, and then we, at the end, cover it with this sort of clamshell detail of our stainless steel cowling. So what we essentially worked out with our engineer was this tube steel structure. It's like a ring that sits on top of the roof framing up here, and it's got a little angle frame support legs that happen here. And then this assembly, cantilevers down into the space. So I have some angle iron that's running like this, and then all this angle iron creates this kind of braced frame going up. And it's a three-dimensional braced frame, and you can see the section. See, I've cut a section here to show the detail. So we worked with our engineer to design this tube steel anchorage at the top and then this angle frame truss of sorts that extends down into the living room and it had to be stiff enough to handle the dead loads and all the lateral loading of this. And you can see it's like this big beam here, but also had to have the right attachment points and that's where this comes in here. So we have our stainless steel cowling, like a clamshell detail that comes in from either side and that gave us a point to either weld to or 
fastened with exposed fasteners. And you can see here, detailing is this decision point. You know, if we have these angles and we have two pieces of stainless steel meeting at that joint there, you can rivet it here to the steel. You can weld it. And if you weld it, you have, you know, aesthetic ideas that you have to think about there. You can mechanically fasten it. So you have some sort of bolt heads or exposed nuts or something. Um, you know, the detailing is an expression of your design intent. And the whole design intent here was to be slick and clean and modern and simple. And this extends to the framing above the roof as well. So we get into this detail over here. The whole design of this structure is simple. It's elemental, right? So we have this chimney coming through the roof here. And I wanted the chimney to be as simple and elemental as possible. So here, you know, if this is the aesthetic goal to make that shape, how do I make that shape? Well, I decided to make stainless steel plate top, some mesh, metal mesh at the sides here to let all these combustion gases out. And then I'm just building a wood box that gets clad in plywood. And then we fasten our lead coated copper flat lock seamed panels on the outside of it. And you can see how that works. So inside of here, we have our mechanical exhaust vent and our flue assembly, but you don't see that. All you see on the outside is this clean detail here. So you come at this with an intent, what you wanna do. I want this simple shape, and then you start backing into it. Okay, how do I make that simple shape possible? Well, it's a matter of wood framing, there's clearances here, and you start sort of refining and layering on the details on top of that. All right, so I wanna take a moment and talk about problems because construction is complex and it's messy, and with every project, there's gonna be problems that you encounter along the way. And this one has one very big difference between the drawings and details we've just been talking about here and the actual finished product. And you may have already noticed it, the boulder is not actually hovering in the space. And given all that we've talked about, that's a pretty big deal. This is a 12,000 pound boulder. So if you wanna hear the story about what happened with that and why it's no longer hovering in the space, I wanna ask you to come over to the members section. There's an additional video there. I post bonus video content, stuff that doesn't always make it into these videos over on the member section. It's not a requirement at all that you become a member or join, but becoming a member helps support the work I do. It's a small monthly fee, and I know not everyone's into that, but it does help me to produce this content and make more of these videos available to you. So, you wanna learn about that? Head over there. Tell me in the comments, was this level of detail helpful for you? Did you enjoy it? How do you go about detailing things? I love hearing from you guys in the comments, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers, my friends.